Hi there, I am Jude Trenier. I work with the Children, Youth and Families team at the Methodist Church and I am talking today with none other than Catherine Gladwell, who is in Harleston, uh, in London, and she is the CEO and founder of the uh, Refugee Support Network, working with young refugees. So we thought it would be a great idea to have a chat with her more about what she's doing and what we can be doing to support people like Catherine who are working uh, with some of the most vulnerable in our society. Catherine, it's really brilliant to see you. It's been a while. Um, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about why you started um, the Refugee Support Network? What was, you know, kind of going on for you that it's quite a big thing to do really, isn't it? Well, we're going back about 10 years. Uh, so I was working for a bigger um, charity, Save the Children, at the time, working in education policy and uh, conflict around education in emergencies. And I was traveling quite a lot with that job and uh, gradually realized that actually um, in my community here in Harlesden, on my doorstep, there were large numbers of unaccompanied refugee and asylum seeking young people. Um, so you started to kind of have various conversations with different people and it came to light that education support, um, particularly for older kids, so like 16 to 19 year olds, was the real gap. Um, and uh, happily, I'd always worked in education, so you know, I was a teacher before I worked at Save the Children. So I, I thought, well, you know, I'm sure we could do something. Um, I was, for various reasons, working four days a week at the time. So I had this extra day in my week um, and got together with a few friends from my local church here in Harsden mm -hmm. to set up what we thought would be a small volunteer-led project um, and would remain that way. So, I mean, it was, it was my living room, uh, no funding, mm -hmm. uh, two volunteers, no paid staff. I think we started um, with a partnership with one local um, Feather Education College here in Northwest London and referrals of 10 young people um, who needed support with their education. So we set up um, what at the time was just a really small educational mentoring project where we matched unaccompanied refugee or asylum seeking children with a mentor from their local community who would meet with them every week and help them with their education. And I thought it would stay that way, but um, gradually over um, the next couple of years, we started to get inquiries from other parts of London, from other local authorities, from other schools and colleges. And I think what really pushed me to actually do something about it from other young people whose friends had mentors and they'd heard about um, what we were doing and wanted to get involved. So at that point, uh, I left my job at Safe for Children and started applying for funding at RSN and uh, we've gradually grown um, from that so today we're a team of 25 staff we work with about 500 young people across the UK each year um, we're still based here in Harlesden but uh, thankfully we no longer work in my living room although obviously at the moment I am working in my living room <laughs> normally things have changed <laughs> yes and I mean obviously you sort of say the exponential growth of this project has been huge so the need is obviously uh, very significant and you've worked with starting with 10 young people and now you're working with over 500 um, like can you tell us maybe some of like maybe the stories of some of these these young refugees I know when I met you a few years ago you know certainly there was you know we got to, to speak with some of those young people it was inspirational mm. and the difficulties that they had come through that I think a lot of adults would probably have not managed to come through well. And yet they had come to this country and were beginning to thrive, um, yeah. you know, in partnership, obviously, with the Refugee Support Network. Mm. Is, there, is there maybe a couple of, uh, couple of things that you could share now that might give us an insight into what these yeah. people are yeah, experiencing? Yeah, sure. Um, and I mean, then there's so many, so many stories that, that we could share. And um, I think I, I'm, reminded just as, as we're talking of one particular young person whose story kind of reflects elements of various young people um so um a girl who uh, actually i mean she also actually has quite an unusual story in that she comes from uh north korea which um right. is not not that common to find young refugees yeah. 
from North Korea who actually make it all the way to the UK. And most of the young people that we work with are from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Iraq, from Eritrea, um, countries that um, you wouldn't be surprised to, to, to hear about. Um, but this young person is one of the most resilient and um, I think hardworking and determined young people that I have ever come across. Um, she uh, left North Korea when she was uh, 13. Um, various family members had been uh, imprisoned and had died in prison camps and she was smuggled out of the country. Uh, she spent some time in China um, and was actually eventually um, picked up by an American uh, pastor who sent her and um, bought her a plane ticket and put her on a plane to the UK um, not even understanding at that point what the immigration and asylum system that she would face when she got here was um, anyway when I met her she said um, education is the key that is going to unlock my future for me um, I want to build I want to build back I want to put the pieces of um, my life back together um, and education is what, can, is what is going to enable me to do that. Um, she started getting the support of a mentor and we actually managed to get her a place on a brilliant course, a really quite unusual course on, in a school here in London that has an adapted GCSE programme where young people who don't have English as a first language can um, study a set package of GCSEs with integrated English as an additional language support, which as you can imagine can make all the difference in terms of actually getting a set of useful qualifications. Um, so she did that um, and she then went on to study at university um, and is part way along um, what is obviously a long journey but to becoming a doctor and um, oh. some of her kind of reflections through COVID-19 about you know what she wants to do to um, contribute to the communities that she is part of and that she lives in um, and why she's studying medicine have um, you know, just been incredibly inspiring and uh, it, like I say, there's, there's so many stories of young people mm. that, um, that I could tell that, yes, they've been through really difficult things, but the resilience that they have shown and the, um, the hard work and the determination and actually the optimism and ability to kind of pick themselves up and keep going is, um, is remarkable. Yeah. And mentoring is such an important part of the work that you do, isn't it? In terms of the, it's not just about kind of providing opportunities, but you you offer relationships that are really quite transformational for yeah. young people, don't you? Yeah, it's really interesting, actually. Um, the word volunteer is often a new um, English vocab item for young people that we work with. And it's really interesting when we explain that to young people. And you can see the um, kind of understanding dawning. Um, and we've had young people say things like, OK, so my teacher is paid to help me, my solicitor is paid to help me, my psychologist is paid to help me. This person is helping me just because they want to and they are glad that I'm part of their community. And you can see something of the value of welcome um, and inclusion that are you know, so important to us, kind of being transmitted just in the concept of what is going on. And that's before the relationship itself actually kicks in and then you get, you know, obviously the, um, the positive fruit from that. Yeah. We've had, we have young people who kind of have now, are now giving back into the um, project as volunteer mentors and um, supporting um, the governance of our organisation through the Youth Advisory Board and a leadership programme that we run. And it's just being amazing to see um, those young people actually now take the lead in what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, hugely, hugely transformational. I mean, obviously, for, for a lot of the young people that have come through, um, they're on different stages of their journey. Um, but for young refugees, uh, both within your project and just across the UK at the moment, um, particularly looking at kind of young people, what would you say some of the key or main needs are that they have right now that we should be aware of? Mm, yeah, it's a really good question. And I think as for many groups, um, COVID-19 and the resulting lockdown is proving really challenging. I think two things in particular come to mind for young refugees and one is um, education inequalities are widening for them. So uh, the majority of the young people that we work with um, have not had access to the internet or the technology in terms of 
laptops or computers or other devices to actually continue their learning online and um, neither have they had parents at home who can support them with their studies um, either because they have parents who also have English as a second language and who are also kind of navigating a new system or because they're unaccompanied um, children who are living in, um, in semi-independent living with other young people um, and so we're really seeing that um, challenges in young for young refugees in getting online and continuing their learning um, in this time um, so that would be the first one that we're really seeing um, the, the kind of disadvantages that they already have faced in terms of having to um, lose years of education in their country of origin due to conflict then losing time in their education on their journeys to the UK now they're here and they've got into school but then that's now gone and it's yeah. been very difficult for them to continue learning online and um, the second one would be um, mental and emotional health so there are um, the majority of the young people that we work with have underlying mental health challenges and there are elements of lockdown that um, are really exacerbating that and particularly because uh, lockdown in some ways is reminiscent of um, restrictions on movement that young people have experienced in a much more violent context in their countries of origin and so um, it's bringing back um, a lot of those types of um, memories and traumatic experiences um, from the past um, in addition to just being particularly isolated and not having a lot of the community networks that a lot of us are relying on um, at this time. So yeah. we're really seeing um, those two things come out, that, that need um, for support to be able to carry on learning and we expect that to continue and to um, increase over the coming months and that need for additional um, emotional um, and mental health support. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're all really huge, very significant areas, you know, even listening to the story that you were telling earlier, education is such a vital part of them being able to actually, you know, kind of move on into their lives really here in the UK, isn't it? I think just finally, um, before I let you go, um, I wanted to just ask that as the Methodist Church, uh, what do you feel that we can be doing as a Methodist community here in the UK? Mm -hmm. uh, various churches were all over the UK. What can we be doing either to support you and the work that you're doing, the Refugee Support Network, and or just refugees generally, uh, particularly young refugees here in the UK? Mm. Yes, thank you so much for asking that question. I am, um, I'm, I'm regularly, um, completely bowled over by the support that we have received from um, networks of churches um, across across the UK. I don't think we'd be doing what we're doing today um, without that. So um, I guess three things. Um, firstly, prayer, and I, I. Um, I know that can be a really easy thing to say, or what can you do or you pray? But I, I couldn't, I couldn't mean it more. Um, there's, there's been times over the last couple of months where, um, you know, we really haven't known where um, resources are going to come from, or in situations with particular young people, how on earth they can possibly get resolved. Um, and we've prayed, and we've asked others to pray, and um, we've seen things change that we never thought would change. And so. Um, if I could only ask for one thing, that would be what I would ask for: is that um, is that you pray and please do you know pray for pray for young refugees, pray that they would um, see the challenges in their immigration status resolved, pray that they would um, get the support that they need to um, be able to carry on learning, pray that pray for pray for those that are struggling with isolation and anxiety and um, panic attacks and things like that at the moment. Um, all of it matters and all of it is is hugely appreciated um secondly um in terms of action if um if it's a church that is um based in one of the areas where we operate and um, that's all across london oxford cambridge peterborough and birmingham uh, then think about getting involved as a mentor for a young person. We'd love to hear from people. We're running our mentoring program online at the moment. Um, we've had about 80% of young people successfully access it online. So we are, um, you know, we're still doing, a, um, we'll look to transition back to face-to-face -face work, probably with a blended online component um, as soon as we can. But that's a program that is still up and running and weird. And we're always keen to hear from people that want to get involved um, in that way. Um, and finally, um, 
I mean, I guess obviously in the current climate, give. Um, I think I I read I read something recently that uh, just challenged me personally, which was about um, about uh, God and finances and resourcing and how God provides for us. And um, it was in the context of a story of really miraculous provision um, and a discussion of how you know we wish we could see huge miracles of provision um, more often. As I'm, you know, I'm sure we all do. Um, but uh, this particular writer had said, you know, actually. The way that God normally provides for us is um, through the flow of resources from one pair of hands to another, um, and I I just love that. And um, I think we have we've seen resources flow to us, um, and and I hope from us as well. Um, so if anyone does want to support us, we actually between the 23rd of June and the 1st of July, we have a matched giving campaign um, through the Big Give. Uh, so any donation that is made in that time will um, be doubled in size um, and will really help us with the work that we do. Um, but of course I don't want to encourage you just to give to us so I would encourage people to look at you know, what's going on in your local area, where are the projects with young refugees that need support and what can you do to get involved and in those steps. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, in terms of if everybody was, um, anybody was interested in looking more into kind of maybe doing mentoring or uh, looking up a little bit more about the Refugee Support Network. Uh, you have a website, don't you? Would you be able to just tell us what that is? We do. It's refugeesupportnetwork.org. Brilliant. And you can find us on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all the usual places. All of the usual social media platforms. Exactly. Excellent. Listen, thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, I know that we will be praying for you uh, and for your team and for the young people that you work with uh, thank you. For your time today. Well, thank you so much, Jude, just for um, taking an interest in, in what we do. It really means a lot. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You too.